So uh, last time, we proved a lot of theorems last time, right? Ba Bayes rule, uh, at least n factorial plus three theorems or something like, like that uh, for, for any n. So, so that, that, that was a very productive day, and I want, want to continue with, with conditional probability, uh, thinking conditionally. We did Bayes' rule, but, but I want to do some examples of conditional probability and some more, some more stuff on conditional probability. So basically, the, the topic for today is not just probability, but it, it's thinking. So. Probability is, is how to think about uncertainty and randomness, right? That's the topic for this entire course. So this is not just a statistics course. This is a thinking course. Uh, and the, you know, the math we were doing last time, the math was extremely easy, right? I like multiplied both sides by, by, by something, and then, and then there, there's our theorem, OK? So, so it looked really easy, but, but how, to, how to actually think about it and how to apply it is, is not uh, always easy. In fact, it's often su subtle. So I want to do some examples and, and a few more theorems along the, those lines. Um, so um, I like to say th thinking conditionally, uh, that's one of the biggest themes in, in, this, in this whole course, using conditional probability, conditional thinking. It is a condition for thinking. That is, you can't really think clearly in, in, except under the condition that you understand how to think conditionally. OK, so that's kind of a general statement. Now, now here's a general way to solve a problem. Uh, this is also a course in problem solving. Okay, So I want to just say, in general, how do you solve a problem? And there, there are different strategies for sol solving problems. right? Now, um, one, one strategy that, 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 we, that we already talked a little bit about is, is, is to try simple and extreme cases. That is extremely useful in a wide variety of problems. Um, so I did my undergrad at Caltech. And at Caltech, everyone's hero is, is Richard Feynman, who was one of the greatest uh, physicists of the 20th century. And people like to say that Feynman also had an algorithm, a general problem-solving algorithm that Feynman used. And does anyone know the Feynman algorithm? OK, the Feynman algorithm is write down the problem, think hard about it, write down the solution. So <laughs> that works really well for Richard Feynman, but it, it doesn't work for anyone else that I, that I know. OK, so, so we need better. So this is one strategy. And this is a strategy we'll be using over and over again in the course. A second strategy we'll be using over and o over again that's useful in statistics, but it's useful in computer science, it's useful in math, it's useful in econ, useful all over the place, is to try to break the problem up into simpler pieces. Right? If you have a problem that seems too difficult and complicated, try to decompose it into smaller pieces. Try to solve the small. It's recursive, right? If the smaller pieces are still too difficult, then break up the smaller pieces into simpler problems. So you have more problems, but each problem is easier. And hopefully, eventually, you reach a point where you can solve each of those problems, put the pieces back together. So that's a very, very general strategy for solving problems. So break up problem into simpler pieces. Okay, So that's just a general strategy. But let me write down what, what does that mean in, in, in the context of what we're doing right now. Well, let's, let, let's draw a picture. Here, you know, here's one of our, our Venn diagrams. Here's the sample space S. And suppose we want to find the probability of B, which is some blob, B, B for blob. So suppose that our problem, this is a very general strategy, but, but suppose that our problem is still a generic problem, but, but, but less generic than this. We have this complicated looking blob B, and we want to find the probability of B. We don't know how to do it because it's this complicated blob. Okay? So instead of give, giving up, what we would do is, is break B up into pieces, find the probability of each piece, and add, add them up. So, that, so that's a very simple idea. right? Just break it up into pieces, add up the pieces. But it's a very, very powerful idea. 
So we're going to break this up into pieces. Let's say this is A1, is this rectangle, A2, A3, and here's A4. A4 doesn't actually intersect B, that's fine. So, so we're going to let A1 through AN be a partition of S. Uh, the word partition just means that these, these sets A, which are these rectangles, are disjoint and their union is all of S. So, so we are just chopping up the space into disjoint pieces. They don't have to look like rectangles. Chop it up however you want. As long as those pieces are disjoint and their union is the whole space. That's called a partition of S. Um, so that's a partition of S. Then I don't need to do any kind of calculation. I can just immediately write down what the decom decomposition says. P of B, just, just by the, the second axiom of probability, says if, 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 if you partition a set and you want its probability, then you can just add up all the pieces. That, that's all we're doing. So I can write P of B equals P of B intersect A1 plus blah, 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 plus P of B intersect AN. I don't need to write a proof for this. This is just immediate from the property, just from the axioms of probabilities. It's immediate, right? Because I broke it up into disjoint pieces. So that's immediate. And then remember, we, we, we had like this long list of theorems last time that, that all just followed immediately from the definition of conditional probability. So another way to write this would be, remember P of B intersect A1. I can either do P of B times P of A1 given B or the other way around. So let's do P of B given A1, P of A1. That's what we did last time, so that's a, that's a quick review. If I want the probability of this and this, I can take, I can take one thing and then the other thing give, given the first thing, and I can do it in, in either order. That's why I said we had n factorial theorems, because, because you could do it in any order. Plus, blah, 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 do that for all the pieces. B given A n, P of A n. And uh, this, this, this equation here is called the law of total probability. That's the name for it, but, but I prefer to just think of it as breaking up a problem into simpler pieces. So the proof is already just written here, right? It's, it's, it's immediate, okay? It's not like we have to, you know, spend 20 minutes trying to prove this. It's just immediately true. Uh, so whether this is useful or not, depends on how well you chose this partition, okay? So, so, so statistics is, is both a science and an art. It, it takes a lot of practice. That if, if I had chosen this partition in certain ways, then I, I, I've, I've multiplied, here I only had one problem, and I've multiplied it into n problems, and it could be that each of those n problems is just as hard or harder than when I started with, and that would be a nightmare. But for a lot of examples that we'll see later on in the course, and you'll see in section on the homework and so on, this P of B is complicated, but each of these is really easy, so, so we've split it up into easy problems. So, so that's what we're looking for. You just need experience with, with, with that. The more problems you do, then the, the, the better you'll get at, at kind of guessing what, what would be a useful partition and what would be a useless part, partition. Okay? So, so that's just the general idea of, of why, why is conditional Basically, there's two main reasons conditional probability is very important. One is that it's important in its own right, right? Because, because like I was talking about last time, conditional probability just says, if we get some evidence, how do we update our probabilities based on the evidence? So that's just a very general, important problem. The second reason it's extremely important is that even if we wanted an unconditional probability, like here, P of B is unconditional, Still, a lot of times we need to use conditional probability to, to break it up into simpler pieces. All right, so uh, let, let's do some examples. All right, I'll start with one that seems really simple, but, uh, but actually is kind of surprising, I think. So um, suppose we, we have two, two random cards from, from, just from a standard deck. Uh, so, so we get uh, get random two card hand. So r random two card, uh, random two cards out of a fifty two card deck uh, from standard deck. 
And, and, then, and then let's, co let's compute two different conditional probabilities. Okay, one of, one of them, uh, so suppose, that the, suppose we're given that, that, that this hand ha has, has an ace. Okay, and we want the probability that both cards are aces. So, so let's do two things. First of all, let's find the probability that, I'm just gonna write this in words, but we could also you know, define some notation for the different events, but I'll just write this in, in, in words. Uh, we wanna find the probability that both cards are aces given that we have an ace. That is, I'm just gonna write have ace. If you write it mathematically though, this would be a union. Uh, it would be the union of the first card. Um, we don't necessarily have an ordering of a first card and a second card, but we can imagine that we got dealt one card first and then got dealt a second card. So this would be the union of the first card being an ace and the second card being an ace. That is, we have at least one ace. All right, so that's one problem. Seems, seems like a pretty simple problem, okay? But there's actually a lot going on here. And then a second problem is to find the probability that, that both cards are aces given that we have the ace of spades. Okay, so that's what we wanna do. So let's do the first thing first and then the second thing second. Um, the probability of both aces, this one, given that we have an ace, I'm just gonna, this is just practice with the definition of conditional probability. So the probability of A given B is the probability of A intersect B. Now in this case, uh, I'll, I'll write it out, but then I'll simplify it. Both aces, and we have an, both cards are aces, and we have an ace. But if you already told me that both cards are aces, then it's redundant to say we have an ace. So the intersection of this event and this event is just this event. So, so that's redundant, so I just crossed it out. Okay, divided by the probability that we have an ace. Now the probability, this is just a quick review with the, the naive definition. We can use the naive definition here because we're assuming all two card hands are equally likely. The probability that both cards are aces, well, you can choose whether to do this problem using order or without order, but let, let, let's just do it without order because I don't really care about the order of the hand. There's four, if the card consists of two aces, there's four choose two possibilities, right? Choose two out of the four aces. And the denominator we know is 52 choose two, because we're just picking two cards out of 52. Naive definition. The denominator, the probability that we have an ace, there's two ways to do that. Either we could break it up into cases. So there's two cases. Either we have two aces, and you can find that. We just did that. Or we have one ace and one non-ace. Those are two disjoint cases, we could add them up. I think it's a little bit easier to do the complement, but you know, you'll get the same thing either way if you do it correctly. If we do the complement, then what we're saying is it's one minus the probability that neither card is an ace. The probability that neither card is an ace, well, there are 48 non-aces in a deck, right? 52 minus four. We can choose any two of them divided by 52, choose two. And if you simplify this, you get one over 33. So, so about a 3% 3, 3 chance of, of this happening uh, after simplification. Okay, now let's do this problem. What's the probability that both are aces given that we have the ace of spades? So P of both aces given that we have the ace of spades Uh, there, again, there's more than one way we can do this problem. We could just kind of, I'm, we just plug into the definition. The numerator would be, what's the probability that we have both, this and this would say we have the ace of spades and we have some other ace, right? And then you could do the denominator. And you could work that out. Um, I, I would prefer to think of this in a simpler way, but, but for, for practice it's good to see that you get the same answer either way. I'd rather think of this more directly. Just what does this mean? Uh, we have two cards here. Now, I didn't say anything about order or unordered, but we're given, that is, we learned this information, we learned that we have the ace of spades. So here, here's my, my, my two card hand, and we have the ace of spades, I'll abbreviate that to AS, ace of spades. And of course, if we want, we can put the ace of spades on the left and the other card on the right, and so I'm holding these, I have the ace of spades here, and this one here, okay? And so this card is, is the mystery card, right? 
Now this, this second card could be any card other than the ace of spades, right? By symmetry, this card is equally likely to be any of the 51 cards in the deck other than the ace of spades. Right? There's, no, there's no reason that this is more likely to be the jack of diamonds than the ace of clubs, right? Completely symmetric. Therefore, we can immediately just write down the answer, 3 over 51, because if this is any of the other three aces, then we have both aces, and otherwise we don't. So it's immediately 3 over 51 by symmetry. You could write something more analogous to this, and if you did it correctly, you'll get the same thing, but that's simpler. 3 over 51 simplifies to 1 17th, right? 1 17th is, uh, uh, it's basically double this. If this were 1 over 34, it would be exactly, exactly double. It's about twice as likely. So let's think about that, that for a second. D does that make sense? Here we have an ace, and we haven't specified what suit it is. Here, we specified that it was the ace of spades, and suddenly our probability almost doubled. Now, if I had said ace of hearts here, that's not going to change, right? It's still going to be 1 17th. If I had said ace of clubs here, that's not going to change. If I said ace of diamonds here, it's not going to change. The problem is symmetric. It doesn't actually matter that it's the ace of spades. We don't care what suit it is, right? It could say hearts, clubs, diamonds, spades here. It's still going to be 1 17th. And yet here, where we didn't specify it, is 1 over 33. So I'll, I'm going to let you think about the, the, this problem for, for, for a while. I'm, I'm not, this is a problem that you, you could spend hours and hours try, try, trying to, to build an intuition about. Uh, I'm mainly doing this just for practice with the definition and to show you that even something that sounds, this sounds like a very simple problem, okay? But already something very surprising is, is going on here. So conditional probability can be very, very subtle. Uh, one, one, one hint for thinking about it is, here, we're saying we have an ace. That means at least one, right? Now, here, well, we could say we have at least one ace of spades. But if we say there's at least one ace of spades, we're just saying we have the ace of spades, because there's only one ace of spades. So here, you're, you're, here I can specifically say, here, I have the ace of spades, something else. Here, it's complicated. I can't draw the same picture here as, as there, because I'm just saying there's at least one ace. So, so that there's a difference here in terms of talking about at least one or a specific one. All right, so, so that's just a fun problem to think about with, with, with conditional probability. Uh, let, let, let's do another example. I mean, th this kind of thing actually is important in, in, in gambling, but let, let's do one that, that's important just in, in daily life. Um, so suppose that we're, we're uh, testing for a disease. So th this is a problem that, 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 that is, you know, comes up ev every day, everywhere in the world, in, 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 you know, a medical, uh, in the medical context. So suppose that you know, the, a patient comes in and, 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 and is getting tested for a certain disease. Okay. This is a good problem in just illustrating. You have to think very carefully about what you're conditioning on, that, that what, what's your goal. And, that, and that, that's a hint you know, for the homework as, as well, that, to try to clearly specify what are you trying to find. What, and make up some clear notation, and then, and then say very, very explicitly, our goal is to find P of what given what, that kind of thing. OK, so patient gets tested for disease. And suppose that that, that, that particular disease afflicts 1% of the population. Or maybe you want to say 1% of people who are you know, similar in, in you know, demographically, same age, and, and so on as, as, as this patient. 1% of, of similar patients have the disease. Okay, that's the assumption. Um, and suppose that the patient tests positive. That, that's the result. And even though testing positive sounds good, uh, that's actually bad. Test positive means that, means that the test is, is asserting that the patient has the disease. Now, the test could be wrong, right? But if the test is, is, is correct, then that, that means the patient has the disease. Okay? So that's what positive test means. Now, suppose we, 
So yet, so far, I haven't said anything about how reliable is the test, right? So some, some diseases are hard to, to detect, OK? And so some diseases are easy to detect, some are hard to detect. And, and you know, some, some tests work better than other tests, right? OK, so, so we need some assumption there. And so suppose that the test is advertised as being 95% accurate. I mean, that, that's a typical kind, you know, you might see some marketing that the, that the people who manufacture this particular test and they say it's 95% accurate. But what does that actually mean? I'm putting that in quotes because that's not yet precise enough to actually do anything with. So we're going to have to interpret, what, what does it mean for it to be 95% accurate? There's more than one way uh, you can interpret that phrase, so that's ambiguous right now. So, so to be able to solve the problem, I'm, I'm going to make a specific assumption. Uh, so suppose that's an assumption that this means now we start needing some notation for the different events. Uh, so let's define our events here. Let's, let's let D be the event that the patient has the disease. Patient has disease. D, D for disease. Okay. Try, when you're defining events, try to write it out as carefully as possible. Uh, it would be tempting here to just write D for disease, okay? But that, that's confusing, right? What, uh, disease is not an event. The event is that the patient has a disease. Now, it's very, if, if it's very obvious in the context what you mean, then that's fine. But a lot of times, if you're, you're just writing down all, all, all these, you know, B is blood and D is disease and so on, and they're not really events, it's going to be very confusing to, for anyone to understand what you're doing. Okay, so D is the event that this patient, we're assuming we have a specific patient that we're talking about. That patient has the disease. That's event D. And uh, let's let T be the event that the patient tests positive. I, I would normally want to use P for positive, but it's very confusing to use P for probability and P for positive. So don't call your events P. Okay, so I'll just say patient tests positive. Okay, so th those are our two events that we need. I don't think we need any more notation at this point. Uh, so let's suppose that 95% accurate means that the probability um, of t given d equals 0.95 equals the probability of t complement given d complement. So that's an assumption. What this assumption is, so this, that's an interpretation of 95% accurate. And what this says is if the patient has the disease, then 95% of the time, the, the test will correctly re report test positive. If the patient does not have the disease, then 95% of the time, the, the test will correctly report negative. So, 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 so conditional on whether the patient has the disease or not, 95% of the time, the test is, gives the correct answer. Does that make sense? So that's the assumption. OK. But that's not actually what we want to know. What, 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 do, you think, what do you think the patient cares about? The patient doesn't care about that. A patient wants to know whether he or she has the disease, right? So what the patient cares about is not P of T given D, it's P of D given T. Okay, so that, that's our goal. Our goal is to find P of D given T. Now, um, so, so one of the most common mistakes in, in, in statistics as applied in real life is, is confusing P of T given D with P of D given T. Those are completely different concepts. Luckily, we know how they're connected, right? We, know, we can't just say, oh, this is different. We don't just have to say this is different from this. We actually know how they're related. They're related by Bayes' rule, right? So, just, so, so, what, so Bayes' rule, what does that say? Bayes' rule says P of D given T is P of T given D, P of D over P of T. That's just Bayes' rule, which we proved in one line yesterday, uh, Wednesday or Monday. Uh, so that's Bayes' rule. And we already know P of T given D. We know P of D. That's just the, for, the, for the population, so that's 0.01. The only thing left is P of T. We, we don't yet know P of T. So here, here's a little trick. Um, and sometimes if you look in books, they won't state Bayes' rule this way. They'll, they'll do something more complicated with a sum in the denominator, uh, but, but I don't consider that Bayes rule. This is Bayes rule, okay? And now often the denominator is the tricky part. And for, for, for doing the denominator, that's when we do this law of total probability, okay? So it's very common to use Bayes rule and the law of total probability in tandem. 
So if we expand the denominator using the law of total probability, well, that's just going to be p of t given d, p of d plus p of t given d complement, p of d complement. So our, our partition is a very obvious one. The partition is just saying either the patient has the disease or does not have the disease. So we're breaking it up into those two cases, right? So it's hard to immediately see what p of t is, but it's easy as soon as we break it into two cases. So we have two cases. Uh, it's kind of neat also that this, this thing in the numerator, when we write it this way, it's the same thing here, and then plus the case where, where d complement. It kind of has a nice structure to it. All right, so at this point, we, we, know, we know all of these numbers. We can just plug them in. Um, I guess I didn't mention, let, let, let's see, what's, what's p of t given d complement? Well, we know p of t complement given d complement is 0.95. So therefore, p of t given d complement is 0.05, right? Because give, given, right, it's just the complement, okay? So, so if you plug all that in, you get approximately 0.16. Um, so even though the test is, is supposedly 95% accurate in this sense, there's only a 16% chance that the patient has the disease. And that seems surprising both to most patients and to most doctors at, at first. And in fact, there, there was a study uh, done at Harvard where, the, where they asked something like 60, uh, 60 Harvard doctors a question very, very similar to, to this. And uh, something like 80% of the doctors and they were basically asked to guess, you know, what should this number be? And, you know, 80% of the doctors were, said numbers like, you know, 95% or very, very high numbers and, and, and didn't realize that it was so small. So, so what are the, what's the moral of the story? Uh, one thing is you should get a second opinion, right? Get, do another test. And that there are some subtleties that come up there, too, because maybe the second test is not independent of the first test, in that if, if there's something that was causing the test to be wrong the first time, maybe the same thing would happen again. So it would be a good idea to get a different kind of test. Secondly, what, what, what's really going on here? And why is mo most people's intuition on this problem is completely wrong? Maybe they'd guess 95%, or maybe they would, you know, conservatively lower it down to 70 or 80%. But hardly anyone, if you ask this problem, will say 16%. Okay, so why are people's intuitions so completely wrong about this? Well, I think the reason is that they focus on this part of the problem, but an equally, impar equally important part of the problem is this 1% here. And that's what gets ignored. So there's a trade-off here. It's, it's, it's fairly rare that the test is wrong, but it's also fairly rare that someone has the disease. So, so there's kind of a competition between how rare is the disease versus how rarely is the test wrong. And for some, for, for some psychological reason, most people focus on the part about the test being wrong and don't focus on the fact that the disease itself is rare. So most people's intuition is wrong because of that. Uh, here's another, just, just if you want another quick intuition into this problem. Uh, remember we talked about frequentist world last time? Uh, we were repeating the same experiment over and over again. So suppose we didn't just do this with one patient. Suppose we had a thousand. I'm not going to write this. I'm just giving you a quick, quick intuition. Okay? Suppose we, we, we repeated this a thousand times. That is, we have a thousand patients. And j j just speaking roughly, if we have a thousand patients, about 10 of them will have the disease, right? That's 1%. One, that's 1 Maybe not exactly 10, but just, just roughly, intuitively speaking, we'd imagine a thousand patients. 10 have the disease, and let's suppose that for those 10, the test is correct every time. So all 10 of them test positive, okay? Now, now what, you know, what about the other, other nine, 900 and whatever people? Uh, 10 people have the disease, so 990 people do not have the disease. They all get tested, but you know, like something like 5% of those people are gonna test positive. So just roughly speaking, I would in, in that example, I'm not gonna compute exact numbers, so I'm just giving you some intuition. Uh, roughly speaking, 50, that's 5% of 1,000, so about 50 people would test positive who don't have the disease, and about 10 people would test positive who do have the disease. So that's in a ratio of 5 to 1, and 0.16 is about 1 sixth. So, so that, that's what's going on. You have 50 people who tested positive who don't have the disease, and 10 who did. Question? The, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that is an extremely important question. It, uh, in case anyone couldn't hear, the, the question is, will it usually be higher because if the, the, the patient who's getting tested, maybe they came in because they were having symptoms and, and th things like that. So, so the, the calculation would completely change if, if that patient already has information, like certain symptoms that are consistent with the disease. Um, the calculation would, would change, but the principle is the same. The principle is whatever evidence, you, you have some initial, so maybe it's initially 1% if you don't have any evidence. And as you start getting symptoms, then, then that's evidence, and, and you update your, your probabilities, and maybe this 1% would change to some, something higher, and, and that, that would, would change the numbers around. Uh, but the principle is the same. You, you get evidence, and you, you update your probabilities using Bayes' rule. And here's one really crucial and, and beautiful fact about Bayes' rule, is it has a certain coherency property. Um, and, and I kind of do work out the math of this in, in one of the strategic practice problems, but let me just tell you the intuition right now. Suppose that you get two pieces of evidence, not just one, okay? So, so suppose, I'm, suppose you're investigating a crime, and, you, you, and, 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 and there's two possibilities. Either you get two clues, okay, and you update using Bayes' rule, using the intersection of, of those two events, okay? But another possibility would be you get one clue, and then you, you, go, you, you go off and get lunch and take a break. You come back after lunch, you get another clue, okay? So suppose that you updated your probabilities using the first clue, and then you come back later, get the second clue, update again. You'll get the same thing. So, so as long as you, you know, so you can update in more than one step, you can update all at once, you, it, you could update in either order, it's always gonna be completely con consistent. So, so, so Bayes' rule is coherent in, in that sense that, you know, whatever evidence you get, one piece at a time or all at once or some combination, at the, the end result is gonna be what's the probability of, you know, the thing you're interested in given the evidence you, you, you have. So, so uh, that's really nice. So just a couple quick uh, warnings about, about like common mistakes with conditional probability, and then, then we can do another example. Uh, so I call these biohazards. Uh, basically, it's just common mistakes, but they're, they're, they're hazardous to your health if, if you make them, so you have to be really careful. These are common mistakes with conditional probability. Uh, so one is the one we just talked about, confusing P of A given B with P of B given A. And we know that Bayes' rule is how you can connect these two, but they're not the same thing. Sometimes this is called the prosecutor's fallacy. And if you want to find examples of this, you can just ser ser search online for prosecutor's fallacy. That's kind of unfair to prosecutors because defense attorneys make the same mistake. Doctors make the same mistake. People make that mistake all the time in, in everyday life, so it's unfair to just pick on prosecutors. The reason it's called the prosecutor's fallacy is that it's a common situation that, and I don't, you know, maybe sometimes the prosecutor does it deliberately, and maybe sometimes it's because they don't know this stuff, but it's, it's the mistake of, you know, in, if you're deciding a, a criminal case, what you care about is the probability that the defendant is guilty given all the evidence, right? And the mistake would be focusing entirely on the probability of the evidence given innocence, and you want the probability of innocence given evidence, right? So, so those two things get confused. And let me mention one uh, legal example, which is a very sad, true uh, story called the, the Sally Clark case. This is an extreme example, but th there are many other uh, legal cases that are similar in flavor to, 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 to varying or, or, or uh, in varying degrees, similar in spirit to this one. This is an especially sad, true story. So Sally Clark was a British woman who, who had two of her babies b both died for uh, mysterious, unexplained reasons. So, so they were calling it like uh, SIDS, Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. That basically just meant the two babies died and they had no explanation. She was, she was convicted a, a, of murder uh, for her two, two, for, of murdering her two children. And, and here, here's, here's what the... Uh, Here's the, basically the total evidence that was put forward a, against her. Okay, so, the, so, so the prosecution got, got some so-called expert to come up to testify, and that expert said the probability of, 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 of 
you know, uh, assuming that she's innocent, the probability of a baby just spontaneously dying, you know, for, for no apparent reason, the, the, the expert, so-called expert, said that the probability was 1 in 8,500. And I don't know where he got that number from, but let's just accept that. He said there's only a 1 in 8,500 chance that the baby's just going to die mysteriously, if, if, assuming it's not murdered. And that, but, but she had two babies, and, and they both died, which, you know, which is obviously a terrible tragedy for, for her. So he said, okay, well, there was another one, so that's 1 over 8,500 times 1 over 8,500, which is about 1 in 73 million. So the first thing that's wrong with this ties in with what we were doing last time about independence. That assumes independence, uh, which is very questionable here, because it's not really, you know, maybe there's some ge genetic fa factor that, that caused the first baby to die, and then the second baby had you know, similar genetic characteristics that, that led to that. So that assumes independence, which there's absolutely no justification for assuming independence here. But even let's, let's just assume independence for the sake of argument. And let's assume we agree with these numbers, so it's 1 in 73 million. Even then, so she was convicted based on this. They said, well, one, there's only a 1 in, basically they were saying there's a 1 in 73 million chance that she's innocent. So, you know, that's beyond a reasonable doubt or whatever the British equivalent of that is. So she was convicted, went to jail. But that's the prosecutor's fallacy, right? Because the relevant information is not, uh, the relevant thing we want to compute is P of innocence given the evidence, not the other way around. So if, even if you accept this number, that's evidence given innocence, right? How are those things related? Well, they're related by Bayes' rule. So you, know, you could do P of ev evidence given innocence times P of innocence over P of evidence. And I'm not going to try to do a calculation with that. But, but notice that if you write that down, you're going to have a term that's P of innocence. That, that's the prior probability of innocence. That is, that's the probability of innocence before we have any evidence, okay? Now, the va you know, there are billions of mothers in the world. The vast, vast majority of them do not murder th their babies, okay? So the prior probability of innocence is extremely close to one, okay? So, so there's a trade-off between the prior probability vers versus how extreme this, this number is. That completely got ignored, and she, she went to prison. And you know, later it sort of got exposed that, you know, that, that this was wrong, and it's like sort of got overturned. But by then, she had spent years in prison. And basically, I think she, I think she, she, she died shortly after being released from prison just because she was too miserable from that. I mean, it's just an unimaginable trauma. So that was one extreme case. But there are other cases like that. And in fact, I brought two books today. The first one is called Statistical Science in the Courtroom. This is a really, really good book. The other one is called Statistics for Lawyers. This is also a really, really good book. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to talk much about them, but if any of you are interested, you can, you can come look at them after class. Uh, so there are a lot of important connections between statistics and the law. And in, in fact, we have a student in this cl class here who's organizing a group at Harvard that, to focus on statistics and the law. So if anyone is interested, you can let me know, and I'll put you in touch with him. OK, so that's called the prosecutor's fallacy, although it's not <laughs> restricted to prosecutors. Now, another one that I wanted to emphasize is one that, that, just, that I was just leading into when I mentioned prior versus, when I mentioned this idea of prior. So I want to tell you what, what the word prior and, and the word posterior mean. Uh, so, it's conf so the second mistake is confusing P of A. That's called the prior. Prior means before we have evidence. Posterior means after we have evidence. With P of A given B, given B, which is called the posterior, so one instance of that is sometimes students, after you know, the problem says that A occurs, and then they'll be very tempted to write, P of A equals 1, and I, and I ask, why did you write P of A equals 1? And the student says, because it's given that A occurred. Okay? But that, that, that's completely wrong and leads to completely wrong ar arguments. P of A given A equals 1. That's the key thing to keep in mind. That's always going to be true. 
Given that A occur, the P of A is one. But if we just write the P of A, we are not uh, assuming that. So the problem may say we observe that A occurred, and, th and that's, saying that, that's saying we're interested in computing stuff given A, but it doesn't mean you just write P of A equals one. P of A given A is one. So, you know, so when you're writing down conditional probability calculations, you have to be very, very careful about what should you put to the left of this bar, and what do you put to the right of, of this bar. OK. And one, one, more common, uh, one more common mistake with probability is confusing independence with conditional independence. And I haven't yet defined the term conditional independence, so I'll do that now. But, but I'm actually kind of assuming that you already understand what conditional independence means. That is, you should be able to guess what it means. I'll write it down and you see if that agrees with your guess. Con confusing independence with conditional independence. This is, more, this is a more subtle mistake than these first two, but also comes up a lot in practice and, and can, can lead you to completely wrong uh, results. So I want to talk about this distinction. Independence versus conditional independence. So first, let me, let me write the definition of conditional independence. Um, so we say that, uh, so this is a definition, but it should be kind of an intuitive definition. We say that A and B, so if we have events A and B, are conditionally independent. Now we can't just say conditionally in independent. Uh, unless it's clear what we're conditioning on. So, so to say this precisely, we would, we would say conditionally independent given some other event. Let's call that C. So C is what we're conditioning on. We're, we say they're conditionally independent given C. And then the definition should, should be obvious. Just write down the definition of independence. It's just assume everything is conditional on C. So it's just completely analogous. It's just everything's conditioned on C. So that I can write that down immediately. P of A intersect B given C equals P of A given C, P of B given C. OK? So that's the definition. Just looks like independence, except I put give, given C everywhere. So a natural question then is, does independence imply conditional independence? And does conditional independence imply independence? So, so let's talk about those two questions. So first of all, does conditional independence let's say given C but given whatever imply unconditional independence and the answer is no not in general so so if they're conditionally independent they may or may not be independent and there, there's an example that, that, that I worked out in detail on the strategic practice so I'll just, I'll just talk about that example briefly, but you, you can read that example if, if you haven't already. That's the chess player example. Chess, chess opponent of unknown strength. This is a very common situation in real life, right? You're, 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 you're going to, it doesn't have to be chess, obviously. That's just an example. Chess opponent of unknown. So you can make up your own example. But that's one that I like, since, since I like chess. Unknown strength. So, so you're playing chess with someone you've never met before. You assume you don't know that person's rating or, or any, any information at all. So, so you, you have no idea about how good that person is, right? Well, now the, suppose you play a series of chess games with, with that person, same person, and you play multiple games. Now, it's possible that you know, after you win the first few, then that person gets demoralized and collapses and starts playing badly. Well, it's possible that they get mad and they think harder and they want to take revenge and things like that. They ignore all that because I'm just coming up with an example. So let, let, let's assume that con conditional on you know, how strong a, of a player that person is, all the games are independent. That, that, that's you know, reasonable. But that does not imply that the, that doesn't imply the games are unconditionally independent if you don't condition on um, how strong that person is. Because if you think about it, suppose that you, you, you win the first five games or something. Okay? At that point, you'd be pretty confident that, that you are a better chess player than that person. Right? So therefore, the earlier games give you evidence. So, so even though the games are 
you know, seemingly independent, the earlier games give you evidence that helps you assess the strength of your opponent, right? So that gives you evidence that's relevant for predicting the later outcomes. Independence would mean that the earlier games that you play give you no information whatsoever that helps you predict the outcomes of the later games, okay? But actually, the earlier games give you a good sense of how strong that person is. So, so, so that's the distinction. So, so, so it may, you know, it may happen that the games are conditionally independent. I'll say game outcomes are conditionally independent, but not in independent. And when I say conditionally independent, I mean conditionally independent given the strength of your opponent. So that's one example, but it would be good, good, for, good for practice for you to try to come up with your own examples. Given uh, strength of opponent. Um, but not independent. Okay, so that's, one, that's an example in this direction. The last thing for today, though, would be what about the converse question? So let's talk about that. So they're, they're conditionally independent given strength of opponent, but not independent unconditionally. That, that, this is a fairly common structure for this kind of thing where there, there's something that's unknown, okay? And if we knew that thing, it may be reasonable to assume independence conditionally, but without that thing, then the earlier trials give, give us data that we can use, okay? So that's the distinction there. All right, so last thing is, is what about the, the uh, reverse question? So I want to know, does independence imply conditional independence? So if A and B are independent without any, any you know, conditions, uh, so does independence imply conditional independence given C? Uh, okay, so that's a natural question. Given C, in general, is this true? Uh, so this is unconditional independence. Does that imply conditional independence? Okay, and if you had to, to guess, how many of you would guess the answer is yes? Okay, how many of you would guess, guess no? Okay, well, the answer is no, so let's talk about why. It's not obvious. It sounds like unconditional independence. That sounds like a stronger condition. If it's unconditional, surely it should be conditional. Um, it's, it's more subtle than, than, than this case to try to come, up with an, to come up with it. But this is also a very, very, very common phenomenon in real life when you have some phenomenon with, with multiple causes. Okay? So if you, if you have something that can occur and it's caused by, by multiple things, then you can see this kind of thing. So, for, so just to give a counterexample, um, suppose a fi fire alarm go goes off. So let, let's say F is, is fire alarm goes off. Hopefully it won't go off right now. So we can finish doing this example. Okay, now suppose that there are two, just for simplicity, suppose there are only two things that can cause the fire alarm to, to go off. Uh, so that could be caused by two possibilities. Either, uh, actually, let me, sorry, let me call this A for alarm, and let's use F for fire. So it's caused by one of two things, either F that there actually is a fire, right? Or, let, let's say, uh, let's suppose the other possible cause is, is someone's making popcorn, popcorn, and again, do not call your events P, so I'll call that C for corn. And suppose, suppose that ha making popcorn is completely independent of creating a fire, okay? But suppose that either of these two things will cause the fire alarm to go off. And suppose, so suppose, that's an assumption, but I'm just constructing an example so I can assume that. Suppose that F and C are independent, okay? But the key, key observation, what's the probability that, um, What's the probability that, that someone, that, that there's a fire, given that the alarm goes off and no one's making popcorn? Well, according to what I just said, that's, that's one. Because if the alarm goes off, then there are two explanations, either this or this, just like Sherlock Holmes said, right? If you eliminate all the other explanations, if you eliminate the popcorn explanation, it must be that there's a fire. So they, so they are condition, they are independent, they're not, conditionally independent given that the alarm goes off. 
Initially, these are independent. As soon as the alarm goes off, then you want to try to explain that, and, and, and they become dependent, so given A. All right, so, so that's all for, for today.